Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, the uh, October meeting of the Planning Applications Committee. I've just got to read out the usual notice about uh, use of the uh, technology um, and note that the meeting is being filmed for a live stream available on the Council's website and a recording will also be available after the meeting. Public speaking will not appear on camera. And a number of people are joining us virtually, as you've probably just noticed. So we will call them up when we need to uh, on, the, on the screen. Thank you. So uh, we're on to agenda item one, which is the minutes. Is everybody happy with the minutes from the last meeting? Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? Not seeing anybody indicating. Thank you. Uh, there are no questions. Uh, and then we get on to the first re real report on page 13, potential site visits. And Richard Etoff is going to introduce this. Um, just to uh, draw your attention to um, one of the items that is suggested there, uh, officers suggest a uh, visit to the 138-144 Friar Street application. Uh, the reference is 221-235. Just that one. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Has anybody else got any, uh, any any other site visits they'd like to propose? And we've still got the list of outstanding ones, but it doesn't look as though any of those are going to be subject of a site visit uh, for the next committee meeting. Um, but obviously we'll let people know when these are coming forward. So thank you for that. Can we note that? And then uh, we get on to planning appeals on page 17. Uh, nothing to add to this, Chair. There, there are no um, reports this time, but i um, happy to answer any questions. Anybody got uh, Councillor Williams? Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it's not quite a question on this report, but it's certainly related because 12 months ago at this, uh, at your PAC meeting, um, we had this report and there was an appeal lodged at an address in my ward, 11 White Knights Road. And, and there seems, looking on the planning inspectorate, no decision at all on that from 12 months ago. So. I wondered if officers have a feeling of what is causing those delays, what's happening with the planning inspectorate um, that might be causing those, and is that a common thing at the moment? I'm, I'm not sure we uh, do know, Chair. Uh, there, there have been some issues uh, in, in the past couple of years with the inspectorate. I, I, I don't know about this one particularly. We will go away and find out for you. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nobody else on this. Uh, can we note that and move on to item six, which is applications for prior approval? No, nothing further from offices. Thank you, Chair. Anybody want to say anything or ask any questions? No. So can we note that then, please? And then we get to item seven, which is the objection to a tree preservation order on page 27. And Sarah Hansen here to introduce this report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report relates to the objection to TPO 422 relating to one site plus tree at 24 Eldon Road. The property sits within the Eldon Square conservation area, hence any tree works requires a formal notice to be submitted to the LPA. On the 24th of June, a notice of intention to fell the Monterey Cypress was received. Officers did not accept the reasons for felling as being justified and considered the tree to provide high amenity value, contributing to the conservation area. As the service of a TPO is the only way to prevent felling once a notice has been served, a TPO was served on the 27th of July. An objection has been received from the direct neighbour at 22 Eldon Place, raising a number of concerns as detailed in 3.1 of the report. Officers' responses to those concerns are detailed in 3.2 of the report. Officers consider that a TPO is warranted and does not unduly impact on the objector's property, with there being scope to prune to alleviate concerns. The concerns raised are therefore not considered to be sufficient to omit the tree from a TPO, hence the recommendation is to confirm the TPO. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair. And um, I would like to applaud actually the uh, officer's comments and the officer's recommendations on this. Um, 
I, I find it a, a very sad situation that uh, that it 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 seems that the uh, the the tree was not wanted because it was they they were living centrally near to town where there should be less trees. Now, on the other hand, quite in section three point two five, uh, the officer does talk about the fact that that uh, these are areas where the benefits of trees can have a larger impact on more people and are needed the most, for example, with for pollution filtration. Um, I, I think that the officer did a wonderful job uh, repudiating the the uh, the uh, the the the, the uh, refusal of this or the the request to fell that tree and uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate her and I will refer to this uh, I know again in the future should anyone um, uh, try to provide me a ridiculous reason for uh, felling a tree so thank you chair and thank you to the officer thank you anybody else no not seeing anybody so can we agree to confirm this uh, TPO Agreed. Thank you very much. She takes us on to the planning applications to be determined. Just to let people know that there are eight item eight and item ten have got public speaking. So we will take item eight first, then item ten, and then we will deal with item nine at the end. OK, thank you. So we go straight on then to um, the planning application. Uh, at uh, Jesse Terrace on page 35. Thank you, Chair. Uh, there's no update report for this item. Um, this application seeks retrospective planning permission for the installation of UPVC replacement sash windows into the basement, first and second floor front elevation of a terrace townhouse in Jesse Terrace, which is within, within the Russell Street, Castle Hill and Oxford Road conservation area and is also covered by an Article 4 direction. The direction removes permitted development rights from the owners to undertake various replacements, alterations and repairs and planning permission is therefore needed. In this case, the owner was misadvised and the windows were installed without approval. As the report explains, in your office's view, the windows which have been installed, although not of traditional materials, are considered to be well made in terms of style, profile and overall appearance and the level of harm to the heritage asset either in terms of the conservation area, the terrace or the building of itself is considered to be low in terms of harm to their significance in terms of the test in the MPPF uh, as that there is less than substantial harm and the public benefits also weigh in favour of the proposal as set out in the report. The officer recommendation is therefore to approve retrospective planning permission. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We have uh, Avian Williams is here to object to the um, recommendation and then we have uh, the applicant uh, John Henschel who wishes to speak after that so for those of you not seen this before um, everybody gets five minutes uh, to speak on uh, their arguments um, and then the, the committee gets an opportunity to question people if they need to so if we could ask Evelyn to to speak first and just introduce yourself and your role and then we'll start timing the five minutes. Thank you. Hello Evelyn, are you still there? Yes, hello. Um, my name is Evelyn Williams, Chair of Reading Conservation Area Advisory Committee. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening, we'll be over the phone. Um, so Reading CAC asked local ward councillors that this application be brought to the Planning Applications Committee for a decision. Whether this application is granted or refused, it's a very important decision for Reading Heritage and Conservation, for Reading Borough Council planning policy and for Reading CAC. Our objections are summarised in paragraph 4.2 of the officer's report. We have three comments to make this evening. Firstly, climate adaptation and sustainability. We do not dispute the need for climate adaptations in heritage buildings. There are a variety of ways that the thermal efficiency of the windows of 33 Jesse Terrace could have been improved, double glazed replacement windows being one option. The windows that have been installed are UPVC replacements. As noted in paragraph 4.1 of the report from the Conservation and Urban Design Officer, UPVC is not the best replacement option with a shorter lifetime than well-maintained timber windows. Secondly, in relation to appearance, 
these replacements are less distinguishable from wood than some. At more than a passing glance, it is, however, clear that they are UPVC, and the appearance of the glazing bars show that these are two pane with an added glazing bar and not four pane windows. Please refer to the plans at the end of the officer's report. Neither are the horns on the upper sash in keeping with the style and age of the property or the original windows. 33 Jesse Terrace is not a listed building. It's the building of Townscape Merritt in a conservation area. And furthermore, Jesse Terrace is covered by an Article 4 direction to protect architectural features and an Article 4 also in relation to conversion to HMOs. The bar set in terms of harm that the windows cause to the character and appearance of the property and the conservation area is not as high as for a listed building, but there is still a balance that has to be struck. Planning officers consider that the windows are acceptable and recommend approval. Thirdly, why Reading CAC disagree? UPVC windows are one of the most complained about changes in CAs. They do not always replace original windows, as an old property may have gone through many iterations of modernisation of doors and windows in style and materials. Unless the building is listed or there is an Article 4 direction in place, the choice is solely the owner's. The Jesse Terrace Article 4 does not specifically mention replacement windows among the alterations requiring planning permission, but our understanding was that it did, and this is confirmed by Paris 3.2 and 3.3 of the officer's report. Incorrect advice was given by a council officer and the applicant proceeded to install UPVC windows throughout the property. There was an opportunity for this to be halted and rectified, but this was not taken. As a result of the action of classic planning officers, the applicant has less than perfect fenestration on one of the most notable houses and in one of the most notable streets in the CA. There has been a loss in the collective heritage asset of Jesse Terrace. This loss is both financial and qualitative. Officers state that each planning application is assessed individually, and if this application is approved, that a precedent will not be set. We do not agree. If this application is granted, other residents in Jesse Terrace who would like to replace their windows with UPVC of this style, even from this supplier, may decide just to go ahead without incurring the cost of a planning application. Clearly, it is unlikely that enforcement action would be taken. Beyond Jesse Terrace, there are also likely to be implications. We requested that RBC replace the windows at the front with wooden windows as compensation for the incorrect advice that was given. Reading CAC has been engaging with residents in Christchurch and Eldon Square CA in reviewing their appraisals. It is clear that deterioration in properties is a big issue and we have advocated an Article 4 to control changes which affect the character and appearance of the area. Reading residents need to have faith in the transparency of the planning implications of an Article 4 and visibility of its restrictions on permitted development rights. This is currently not the case in terms of the information available on the Council's website or, as we have seen in this case, advice given. As a community heritage champion, Reading CAC is very disappointed by the incorrect advice given in this case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions to Evelyn? Not seeing anybody indicating, so thank you very much. And then we will go on to hear from John Henschel, who's the applicant. Do you want to take a seat and uh, turn on the mic and then introduce yourself? <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Yeah, John Henshaw, I'm the applicant at 33 Jesse Terrace. Five minutes. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, uh, so thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I look to address some of the objections uh, in a moment, but I thought it was important to just state the history and, and the facts of this case. So firstly, by nature, I'm quite cautious and I wanted to do my research before uh, spending such a significant amount on the windows and wanted to do the due diligence before making the purchase. So when I was originally thinking about investing in my home, trying to make it eco-friendly and carbon efficient, reducing heating bills, I set about doing that research. I knew about the Article 4s on the street because I'd done the research when I purchased property in 2017. So I set about trying to understand the limitations of changing the windows. Upon research, I visited the council website, which I see is subsequently being updated based on the report recommendation. But when I visited that website, it kept referring to the Article 4 saying architectural features, and then the link would take me to a document that listed out what the Article 4 was and a map of the area but it didn't say what those architectural features were. So I reached out to the council, made uh, an official inquiry to 
check what was what kind of what was the definition of architectural features. Um, I specifically mentioned that I lived on Jesse Terrace and that I wanted to clarify on the Article 4 terms what could and couldn't be done. Uh, so as the I've said, obviously, I got some advice back for the council. Um, it was an official inquiry. It was planning inquiry FS case 368 455789 if anyone wishes to check. Uh, dear Mr Henshaw, thank you for your inquiry. Being in an Article 4, Article 4 area does not stop you replacing your windows. As long as your building isn't listed or is a flat, you are able to install double glazing under permitted development rights. So I kind of asked like, what more could I have done in my due diligence? It was a significant outlay. I've not just replaced the front, but replaced the back as well. Um, it's a lot of money. Uh, and obviously, if I'd known, I would have applied and I wouldn't want to have caused myself so much stress uh, over the last couple of months. <clears throat> uh, so I should also note that uh, despite the approval from the council, I was personally conscious that I wanted to match the existing styles in the street, i.e. keeping the sash windows as I wanted to maintain the aesthetic. And so I chose the matching style sash windows with wood effect UPVC. Um, as I like leaving the conservation area and I wanted the visual aspects of Jesse Terrace, despite some of the properties as mentioned in the report that have previously decided to install the cheaper double glazing non sash style. Um, I purchased the sash style. The lady who reported said it was two pane windows, but it's actually four pane with the astrical bars uh, as matched the original, uh, just for clarification, if you'd like to check. Um, I also decided to purchase the sash windows at the rear of the property, despite, again, not needing to. Uh, according to the rules, as again, I value the property, I wanted to keep in heritage, again, despite some of the houses on the street that have, again, purchased the cheaper double glazing at the back that, again, doesn't, I think, value the, the property and the aesthetics as much. Um, it should also be noted that I decided against doing the French windows on the street level. Ironically now, as I didn't have the confidence that the company could match the visual aspects of the existing doors uh, and I didn't want to damage the aesthetic on the streets. Uh, I'd also like to state that by installing modern double glazing, I've reduced my carbon footprint in line with the Reading Climate Energy Strategy. Uh, so reducing the heat from escaping the house, reducing the heating bills, um, especially with a, a new three month old baby at home, that's going to be quite critical this winter. Um, and I believe these changes will help towards Reading's target of net zero carbon dioxide emissions in the Reading area by 2030. Uh, anyway, to continue with the history of the case, I note that there was no formal complaint to the council about my windows, but I believe that tip-off came internally, I'm guessing from the, the Reading uh, CAC as, as discussed. Obviously that prompted a same day turnaround from the planning enforcer to visit me, which obviously then caused me quite a lot of stress and undue. Um, I would disagree that there wasn't an opportunity to, to stop partway through. Um, that's my prerogative. Uh, I'd also like to like it noted that as soon as I was informed of the council mistake that I needed planning permission, that I diligently worked with Julie Williams and her team to rectify the issue. And I thank her for her time and the late night phone calls that, that we were on. Um, and would like to include a comment from her uh, at the end of our engagement, which was by email. So again, quote, once again, I'm very sorry for the situation we find ourselves in due to the incorrect advice provided to you, but reassure that we are working together to find a solution. Obviously that solution being that the planning committee or planning council have recommended my application and I hope this council also approves it too. Thank you, welcome any questions. Thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions? Councillor Rowland? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Henshaw, for um, coming this evening. And I am extremely sorry about the stress that this has caused you because I know it has. Um, I, I obviously live in your neighborhood and am one of your uh, Abbey Ward counselors. Yes. Uh, my question for you uh, is, is about the, the level of research you did about eco-friendly uh, windows because um, um, it, it's one of my peculiar um, uh, interest. And I, I'm not sure if you received substantial advising about about the knowledge of, of windows or whether whether even the window company advised you of the fact that UPVC windows generally have a shelf life of 25 years. I myself live in a property with 160 year old wooden windows that are still fine mm. those those 
20, that 25 years of the, of a UPVC windows life then means that likely you'll have to replace that again. And did they inform you that, that UPVC windows are not actually recyclable and that they go into the landfill and that they increase the landfill or not, which does indeed actually probably possibly throw a curveball on your on your perceived carbon footprint because you will probably in due course or the person next after you might be throwing those away. Did you uncover any of that research at all? Uh, I not to that level of extent. My understanding was that there'd be at least a minimum of 35 years for, for the lifetime. Um, in terms of replacing them, the company didn't discuss that with me. I was more thinking heat retention for the home. That home was very drafty, very cold, uh, especially in the winters, it regularly dropped down to 14 degrees inside. I have a four year old and a now a three month old as well. So my interest was how do I make the, the home warmer, more secure? Um, and obviously then that has a knock on effect, reducing the heat bills, which uh, I think the biggest form of, or the biggest blocker to, to get the UK to carbon net zero is home insulation and reducing domestic heating bills, which I suspect this will, this will help. Roland. I do have a follow up. Um, I couldn't agree with you more and and I'm glad that you I'm glad that you're very serious about that. But so you never uncovered any any facts about the fact that you PVCs go into the landfill and they're not recyclable. Then. Uh, correct. Yeah, the, the company didn't tell me that. OK, thank you. Anyone else want to ask any questions? Councillor Carnell. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you for coming along uh, to speak to us. Um, just for clarity, you've replaced a wooden four pane sash window with a wood effect four pane sash window when you could have opted for perhaps cheaper alternative styles. Well, I thought I could have opted for cheaper alternative styles based on the advice I was given, but I wanted to. I really like the fact I live in a conservation area and wanted to maintain that aesthetic. And so I opted to replace like for like as much as I could, but obviously new double glazing instead of the, the I guess the old wooden windows. Yeah, thank you. I, I like Councillor Rowland, regret the uh, stress you've been caused by this. And I think you should be commended for trying to retain the aesthetic when you could have opted for a, a cheaper option. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Not seeing anyone. So thank you very much for coming. And I'm can I add my um, regret that you've been put through this, especially at a special time for a family, new baby and everything. So thank you for coming tonight and um, apologies, I think, on behalf of the council for what you've had to go through. Uh, thank you very right. much. Um, got Councillor Page indicating and then Councillor Rowland. Yes, Chair, um, thank you. Um, this is a bit of a sorry saga. Um, and again, I'd associate myself with the, with the comments made earlier and, and thank Mr. Henschel for taking the trouble of uh, coming along um, in person. Uh, Jesse Terrace is, a, is an important um, island of uh, heritage in the borough. Um, and that's the reason we have um, got not one, but two Article 4s. Uh, in place and the one that relates to this particular issue is the older one um, from 2004 which is why I find it addedly regrettable um, that uh, the error um, was made. Um, that error can be partly excused because if any new or any existing planning officer had tried to find the original article 4 they would have had to have displayed Clouseau-esque um, ability in navigating our website, which on a good day is pretty impenetrable, uh, but in this case um, is still lacking. Um, and as of today, um, whilst the Article 4 
um, uh, the Article 4s are clearly shown very early on when you go on to the planning and building control section of our website, fourth item down, Article 4 directions. Great, you think. So you go to the, you click the link. You've then got reference to Jesse Terrace and architectural features. You carry on down. You then get to Article 4 direction, Jesse Terrace. But it's only the one. It's the most recent one. Is the 2004 Article 4 included on the website there? No, it is not. So even as of today, that the most important um, information is not on there. Now, I don't know where to find it. I genuinely don't know, but I was advised by my colleague, Councillor Rowland, that you can actually find it by going onto the CAC website. The, sorry, the Civic Society uh, website. That is simply not satisfactory. Um, and I would say to, and I know it's difficult in the neighbourhood. Um, there are some neighbours who have expressed concerns, and I know Mr. Henshaw has had some letters of support from, from local neighbours, and these are essentially subjective issues up to a point. But in terms of public information, that is not subjective. Um, and I'm going to propose, Chair, not as a, con a condition to the um, grant of, uh, of planning approval, and I don't think we have much option but to grant um, this evening, but I'm going to propose that we have a separate report back from officers um, confirming that the website has been appropriately uh, amended so that the Article 4 relating to 2004 is actually on that website because it's not acceptable. And, and I would say to those residents who are concerned about the procedure um, that, uh, and I speak as a former employee of the local government ombudsman some years ago, there's a clear case of ballot administration because the council's admitted it. There is a problem around what injustice has been sustained, but if a local resident wanted to try and get um, a complaint to the local government ombudsman, they've cleared the first hurdle because the council's already admitted maladministration, um, showing or trying to justify injustice would be a slightly harder one, but it may be one not without the uh, um, uh, ability of some residents to run. Because if there were finding against the local authority, uh, that would then open up um, a remedy which might be uh, at the local government ombudsman's discretion, and that can involve issues of replacement or compensation or whatever. Now, I'm not in any way prejudging it, but that's the way the procedure um, could run. Um, and it is, it has been um, pretty lamentable, the, the uh, uh, error that was made, because the 2004 um, Article 4 is actually quite thorough. The interesting thing about it is that it doesn't specifically mention windows. It talks about enlargements, improvements or other alterations to a dwelling house that fronts the highway. So that's pretty comprehensive. It then gives example of roof slopes, chimneys, porches, hard surfaces, installation or replacement of a satellite antenna. A, uh, a t antenna. Uh, it talks about gates, fences, walls. It talks about and the painting of the building. Um, now, it's strange that probably one of the most visually important elements, namely a window, isn't referenced. So one of the other things I would ask um, is for officers to report back on whether, uh, without rerunning a new Article 4, there is any way that we can, in terms of A, identifying the Article 4 more clearly on the website, also make it quite clear that windows are included. Um, because if we're talking about slopes and antennas and gates and fences, uh, it does seem an omission from that original um, Article 4. Um, so, Chair, I'll leave it at, uh, at that. Um, I think we do need a report back then to the committee. This is not a condition that we're attaching to the planning consent. This is a separate resolution, but a belt and braces on A, getting the website sorted out, um, and B, um, the issue of referencing windows when we have that Article 4 clearly there. It's not part formally of that order, but uh, it really does need to be 
um, in, in sort of big flashing lights so that any future resident doesn't have to go through the sorts of uh, hoops and uh, trauma and stress, well, I won't use trauma, stress in, in his own words that Mr. Henschel um, has uh, experienced. And I'm grateful, I would say, uh, to Mr. Henschel for, for at least doing the due diligence that he has done because many of those grottier um, UBVC windows that he's referred to were installed prior to 2004. They are quite old. Um, I think one actually has been installed since, but that raises separate enforcement um, issues. Um, but uh, I would put on record as well that I don't like UPVC windows in any shape or form. Uh, Councillor Owens referenced one of the reasons, um, but uh, um, that I'll leave it at that, Chair. So if I could propose that as a separate um, motion. Thank you, Councillor Rowland. Thank you, Chair, and I, I thank Councillor Page for his comments. And and again, you know, I I really uh, agree with the fact that it's a really regrettable uh, circumstance that that has kind of led us to this. Uh, when the windows were installed, uh, we never had such a great response to uh, one of our counselor surgeries when we had six individual members of, of the community uh, come storming down to, um, you know, get, get very, very excited about this because people that live in that conservation area and on that street do care very much, especially on that street, do care very much about the heritage of the area. Um, they were concerned about, about where this left the Article 4 in the future. Uh, obviously, uh, having to apply for, for planning permission should they want to do their windows and, and what kind of standards would be held. Um, so there's there's a lot of implications that residents rightly felt about the weakening of, of an area that they felt was very well protected. Uh, I will say that I don't think there is one resident on that street that would wish, wish their new neighbor any, any harm or any upset. I think they all feel sympathy for you, as do, as do I, uh, um, on this situation. Um, I, I would go a little bit further on the on the situation that Councillor Page stated in asking for a, a separate resolution uh, in regards to what kind of reparations can be done for the community on this. Um, Councillor Page did mention windows. I think I would also I would also mention doors too because there there have been issues with doors in the past. Uh, that that have been turned down based on that article uh, four from 2004. What that article four from 2004 also does not do is it does not list the uh, the phrases of like for like and also materiality and materiality may be something uh, that we would very much want to look into. So again, with Councillor Page's comments, I would I would suggest that we look to see without a major um, rewriting of an Article 4, but to look about strengthening strengthening that Article 4 from 2004 and also look possibly to attach the local development order or an LDO, which we have situated in the local plan. And I made sure of that uh, back when the local plan was written uh, so that if you are to Actually, when, when you use a local development order in conjunction with an Article 4, uh, if someone were to replace a window, a wooden window, with another wooden window, it would be like for like and therefore not even require them to, uh, to actually apply for planning permission. So that's an interesting aspect that could be looked at in, in an Article 4. So uh, I, I would say that, that apologies are certainly due to the CAC and to the residents and to the the people in the area when an error has been made and and it is um, it, it it is an error that that the council has made it is maladministration and it has unfortunately left Mr. Henshaw in the middle of a of a very um, 
a very uncomfortable situation that he did not intend. I will leave. I will. I will leave officers with this, and and just remind them that our planning, our planning area is the are the protectors through these Article Fours of our heritage in this town, and when that falls down, you see that the the civic society, you see the conservation area advisory committee. Um, uh, become upset. You see, you see residents around it that relied on their homes being being made special and being buoyed uh, in value and and just the sheer physical enjoyment of living on Jesse Terrace, all let down. And and I feel um, very very badly about that. And I and I think that we owe the that that community uh, an apology. Our conservation area, that conservation area is on the at risk register because of loss of original features. It's something that our planning department knows very well. And I do hope that in the future that 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 is a point that is not forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to say anything? Not seeing anyone. Can I just also before we move to a vote, Councillor? Something's gone wrong with that. Uh, you came in in the middle of this one, so I'm advised that you you probably know that anyway, that you shouldn't vote on this particular item. Uh, right. Um, okay. Uh, take, that's a love lock. Can I just say a word? Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, okay. Julie. Sorry. Um, yeah, I obviously um, clearly I would like to apologise on behalf of the planning uh, section, the planning service and the colleague involved. Uh, for the wrong information being provided to Mr. Henshaw. I think it was actually last October um, 2021 that um, Mr. Henshaw made his initial inquiry about the Article 4 direction. So, um, you know, and I don't think we were notified of the works taking place until July. So, uh, you know, looking back over time, if only there was another chance to have another conversation, you know, we could have reversed or, or prevented this situation from occurring. So, you know, I've, I've got no hesitation in apologising to both to Mr Henshaw and to the community. You know, I know full well and, and the fellow planning officers know full well the importance of Article 4 directions. Um, and since um, July, uh, we have been looking at, as, as say, Council Page has already mentioned, that's given more prom prominence to the Article 4 direction. But we are also looking at, um, with colleagues, um, Mark Wilgham's team in policy, at improving, making the Article 4 directions, because there's, there's there's some applying to most wards in the borough, which affect the pattern brickwork and other detailings that we need to make these more, 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 more um, under, easily understood by the homeowners who probably have got, haven't got a clue what Article 4 actually means. And also so that the planning officers and those doing our duty um, inquiries, as in this case, can also easily see what an Article 4 means and, as you say, spe specify what it does and doesn't allow somebody to do without first granting plan permission. And so just to be clear, Article 4 um, have the effect of taking away what would normally be permitted development rights. And so we need to make clear exactly what is permitted or not permitted. And so, yeah, please rest assured that we are looking at improving that. Um, on our website, and I'm happy to bring a report back to PAC to explain what our proposals are. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Julie. Right, as I said, uh, we'll take the vote in two parts. Firstly, on the actual application, and then on Councillor Page's um, request for us to have an additional um, recommendation, which asks for that report to come back to us as soon as possible, I would suggest. So can I see all those who are in favour of granting planning permission for this application? Thank you, that's unanimous. Uh, and those in favour of the, re the uh, request for a report back as soon as possible on improvements to Article 4. Thank you. That was unanimous as well. Uh, thank you. And I, can I also just say again, we're really sorry you've had to go through all this. And um, I hope that uh, we can avoid anything like this happening for other people as a result of your very distressing experience. Thank you. And also, I think, uh, again, to the CAC, I understand absolutely why they're really upset about this. And uh, they're right to be. So. Um, 
apologies all round to everyone. Thank you very much. Takes us on, we're going to take um, item 10 next, which is the application in, in Whitney Ward for Travellers site. Uh, and I believe that Ethne Humphreys is going to introduce this report. It's on page 89. Thank you, Chair. I hope you can hear me OK. Yes, thank you. This is a council owned Regulation 3 application for a Gypsy and Traveller transit site located on the south side of Island Road. The proposal comprises seven transit pitches, each with its own sanitary block, a communal play and picnic area and other on site facilities, including a welfare office and waste and recycling facilities. The typical duration of stay would be between a minimum of one to three days and a maximum stay of three months. The first slide shows the location of the site within its wider context, alongside an aerial view of the site and the site layout. The second slide shows some site photos taken at various times in the year. The photos at the bottom of the slide look towards the site from Island Road, and the photos at the top of the slide look towards the side of the site from the recycling centre, which is located to the west of the site. As a Reading Borough Council own application, the site would be managed to protect not only the people who would occupy the site, but those members of the public who surround it. The usage would be governed by a licence setting out strict regulations on how the site is used for the temporary periods it may be occupied. The site would also be supervised by a site manager to ensure that the site is kept to a high standard in the interests of all concerned, gypsies and travellers and members of the public, providing the necessary security. As noted within the main agenda report, the site is subject to a number of constraints and designations, including its location within the functional floodplain, its siting between the recycling centre and waste treatment plant, and its location within the detailed emergency planning zone of the atomic weapons establishment Burfield site. The officer report has considered all significant aspects of the proposal and the site, and has acknowledged and addressed the objections raised by consultees, as well as representations made from members of the public. As acknowledged in the report, it is clear that there are policy conflicts with the proposal. However, there is policy support for the provision of gypsy pitches at both national and local level, as well as, importantly, a statutory duty for the council to provide such pitches. Specific government guidance on gypsy and traveller sites is provided within a supporting document titled Planning Policy for Traveller Sites, which is referenced in the officer report. This document makes clear that local planning policies should identify a five year supply of deliverable sites for traveller accommodation. The document sets out that if a local authority cannot de demonstrate an up to date five year supply of deliverable sites, this should be a significant material consideration in any subsequent planning decision and when considering applications for the grant of temporary consent. As evidenced within the officer report, Reading Borough Council does not currently have a transit site for gypsies and travellers, and there is no policy in the development plan which allocates sites for gypsy and traveller pitches. It is clear that there is a lack of a five year supply of gypsy and traveller sites and clear that there is a significant unmet need in the borough that is unlikely to be resolved in the near future. Despite attempts to find alternatives, no other sites have come forward or have been found available. The planning policy for travellers sites document aims, amongst other things, to reduce the number of unauthorised encampments. There appears to be no identifiable prospect for several years to come of a plan led solution to reduce the use of unauthorised sites. The lack of any policy designed to bring forward new sites adds further weight in support of the proposal. The proposal, which would help to meet an identified need, would also significantly help to reduce the number of unauthorised encampments across the borough which would be a significant benefit of the proposal that carries weight. Unauthorised encampments can be costly, time consuming and disruptive, including to communities and local businesses. Provision of a transit site within the borough would make it easier for the police to move on unauthorised encampments, utilising powers under the Criminal Justice and Public Order Act. However, the powers available to the police are only available if there is a caravan site available elsewhere in the local authority area. The ability to use these powers in Reading is therefore currently restricted by the lack of sites. To conclude, national policy and guidance dictates that such an unmet need and the lack of available deliverable sites carry significant weight and when determining applications for temporary permissions. 
having regard to the information within the officer report, including those comments received in representation objecting to the proposal, it is considered that the factors in favour of the proposal for a transit site outweigh the acknowledged negative impacts. Members will need to consider the planning balance and the various competing issues in this case. Whilst acknowledging the level of objections raised, these have been carefully considered and assessed in the main agenda report. Officers have identified important material planning considerations that favour the application as submitted. In this respect, the development proposal is considered necessary in terms of meeting the critical need for gypsy and traveller pitches, and there is a clear lack of viable alternative sites. This weighs heavily in favour of this proposal, and in the planning balance, this critical need is considered to outweigh the various harms identified. There is an update report that provides further clarification on matters of flood risk and site allocation. The recommendation is to grant temporary planning permission for 10 years, subject to the conditions as set out with the main agenda report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we have public speaking. Uh, we've got uh, Adam Balding, uh, who wants to speak against uh, the proposal. And then uh, we have uh, Rob Shrimpton, uh, who's planning consultant, and he is going to speak after Mr Balding. We also have a number of officers uh, online who um, can add information if we should need it. So, Mr. Bolding, welcome. Thank you for coming. Would you like to just uh, explain who you are and what, what your interest is, and then we'll start your five minutes. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Adam. Um, I'm a resident of the Kennet Island area, um, and I also sit on the resident management company. So the representation of the 3000 residents that live in uh, Kennet Island. Um, and they've asked me to come here today to represent them. So I should say that several of my opinions and elements I will say today are my own opinion, and some are uh, ones that have been given to me by other represent other people in the borough. Thank you for that. So we'll start your five minutes now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the summary of of my objection is that two wrongs don't make a right. Um, the report details that the sole benefit of this application is that the council desperately needs it. And I think that's an appropriate word, desperate. Um, however, it also states that the reason that it needs it and all the provision should be in the aid of allowing gypsies and travellers to get healthcare be in the local facility to healthcare and education. The site proposed does neither of these things. The sole therefore benefit of this site is by its own admission in the report to prevent illegal encampments elsewhere and antisocial behaviour. However, those objections by the residents of Kennet Island and Green Park were considered to be potentially discriminatory if they raised them as an objection, which I find sad. If we go through the objections that the actually have been raised by residents in the local area of Kennet Island and Green Park, um, it actually is far more about the environment, the ecology, the safety of the site, um, the air quality, the soil. In fact, if you actually go through the full report, every element of the report says that this is an unsuitable site. It's going to be incredibly costly to build there in order to remediate just some of the things that are identified. The soil is contaminated. The air has two and a half times the amount of carbon dioxide appropriate. It is too light, too noisy. It is next to a sewage works. It is not next to any education. It is not next to any um, medical facilities. Every single local business objects and every resident I've spoken to and has come forward to me has objected to the planning. I'd also like to note some of the irregularities in the planning application and the way in which it's been handled. Uh, no resident has come forward to say that they received a letter from the council about the planning application. Uh, the report does state that a considerable amount of time was given to consultation. Um, the report actually identifies multiple local businesses that would become the local amenities, such as the Londis um, and the Hudson's located within Kennet Island, as well as the uh, cafe. None of those businesses were consulted. None of the residents that have come forward to us have been consulted. They were only consulted after they approached the council and were given only days for the consultation. We then reached out to local councillors, one of which is sitting on your board today, um, who requested then for an extension to that consultation period. The invitation to the meeting today was only received on Monday, two days ago, with a date 
allocated as the 7th of September for the time of this meeting in the past. There are, <laughs> there are so many things about this application that unfortunately seem to be very coincidental to the stage where residents have quite openly said to me that they don't believe they are a coincidence, that this is just being pushed through and that their opinions are not being listened to and nor does the council wish to listen to their opinion, that they are just so desperate to have this site somewhere in Reading that they are rubber stamping this and that they're just going to push it through. And that is sadly the opinion of the res residents of Kennet Island. Um, if you'd like me to go through some of the objections, I'm more than happy to, but the location is unsafe. AWE have, op have opposed it, Thames Water have opposed it. Absolutely everybody who's actually formally looked at this application has said that it should not be placed to where it is. And the thought and the idea that this is the only location in the whole of Reading that could possibly be this site, be this, uh, be the planning for this site, is um, I'm sorry, laughable because in the uh, in the report itself it says that the only location that was found was actually Cow Lane, and that then after Cow Lane had an objection from Reading uh, from Reading Festival, then the site next to the dump was was proposed. I believe that if this planning were to be uh, not granted and refused, another site would be found. I think there are far better sites in Reading for this. If you actually really care about the Traveller and Gypsy community and you want to and you actually want to provide them with a location where they can get healthcare, access to education, there are far better locations than next to a dump in a place that is unsafe. Thank you. Um, just, about, just about on time. Thank you. I would like to stay there and see if there's any questions from any of the committee. Anyone wish to ask any questions? More, more, of a, more of a comment, just to um, thank Mr. Boulding. You know, it's, it, there is a question. A question yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, hello, Adam, Mr. Boulding. Adam. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know Adam and members of PAC may recognise um, Mr. Boulding from a uh, previous application on Reno Retail Park, where um, he put forward a representation about alarms, waste management, and HGVs. We listened as a, as a planning applications committee to try to get some mitigating conditions, as in reducing HGV traffic through Kennet Island for improved signage. We also got um, a condition on waste management and alarms and an informative on the latest um, uh, one that came for uh, uh, um, Brunel Retail Park. So I, I, I value his opinion. He um, he speaks for a lot of Kennet Island res residents. My, my, I, I'm going to ask questions later on to um, the uh, officers and obviously I've been contacted by residents on issues around, op around the operations and such like. So it's just to say my question would be, I hope that you feel that you can come forward to your councillors and council and we, d we do try to, to help where we can. And there's there's nothing, I think, uh, read in an email, nothing mm -hmm. underhand about anything. It's all out in the open. You know, we are here as a planning committee to um, look at the report and judge it, and we, we take advice from from our planning officers and we make decisions and obviously represent the views of our residents. OK, thank you. The, um, I, it is the opinion of the local residents, and I, and I do apply. I am re representing their opinion in total. People, multiple people have told me that there is no point coming today, that this is being pushed through and that the multiple now coincidences with administrative errors that have happened with this planning application when it comes to discussing it with the local community and consulting mean that they don't believe that there's going to be any fair. And it's and it's sad that I have to say that I'm very sorry that I have to report that to you. Your next clarification um, mentioned about Cow Lane um, being considered and then changed because of an, uh, an objection by Reading Festival, isn't it because there's a school going on there? Isn't it because there's a school going on there? That was then the proposal for the site after the Gypsy site was yeah. there. <coughs> so it was stopped. proposed, there was consideration, but because it's now and it was rejected for a school. Yeah. yeah, and not just because it was a yeah. object. But the, that was Festival. by the report's own admission, it was the only, it was the sole site in Reading that was found. But then after it was rejected, then the site next to the dump was found. So I, I again, I would just refute that 
the idea that's being put forward in this report that this is the only location in the entirety of Reading that this site could possibly be on, and that's the only reason why, therefore, the planning must be granted, even though it's unsafe, is invalid. Come back. So you would you agree that the Cow Lane site, which, you know, was considered, has been taken out of the equation because there's a school going on there? Yes. You rejected the planning application for the Gypsy and Traveller site, and so now there is a school going on there. Okay. What what educational facilities and healthcare does the site next to the dump plan to provide for the Gypsy and Traveller community? Yeah. Okay. Councillor Rowland, I think you've got a question. Right, my, mine's a follow-up from Councillor Ennis's. Um, you're, you're, um, I guess, expressing uh, concern that that there couldn't be any other possible, or that there's got to be other possible sites. But um, in all of your research and the research of the committee and, and residents, uh, were they not aware of the report that actually was in our update pack uh, today? The, the link the link was given for that of uh, the report from 2017 that that specifically reviews all 80 of those sites and then shows and, and some whether they were viable or not. It, 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 it's a very long ranging report. Did they act? Did you all actually take a look at that report and come to understand um, why we are where we are today? No, um, no reports have been sent to any resident that has spoken to me. I have personally not seen that report. I have requested it and have not found it. Um, it was one of my questions as to how on earth can 80 sites really a, a location that is unsafe and unfit actually be the only option and I was I was unable to find that. It, it it's on the website and is is a publicly available document that because because as I'm sure you're aware I mean this has been going on for an awfully long time so it's it's a pretty available uh, um, report that that you could probably fairly easily find so I'm, I'm very sorry that you didn't didn't have the opportunity to see that. Um, yeah, I would um, I would consider my IT skills above that of the average uh, person. Um, I would say that I work in uh, in um, regulation and other areas of, with considerable documentation and works with governments and I have not found it. So it is not easy to find and no resident has come forward to say that they have found it. They have looked for it and so have I. Councillor Lane. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Bowling. Um, obviously, uh, I know you have quite a good relationship with my, my colleague, Councillor Eden, yeah. and um, obviously I've, I've attended uh, meetings with the local police with you and worked with you quite well. Um, um, I understand because I sit on the Planning Applications Committee, you may not come forward to me first, but you've been in contact with uh, Councillor Eden. Did, uh, did you at any time ask uh, Councillor Eden for any information for residents on, on these? Uh, 80 sites or previous previous uh, not on the 80 sites yeah. um, I did we did however come forward to ask for her help with extending the consultation period and asking yeah. why we were only given a matter of days and why no one had been consulted mm -hmm. um, and she gave us help where she could um, unfortunately the oh, sorry unfortunately say unfortunately unf unfortunately the primary help actually came from Alloc or the local MP um, so uh, every resident of Kennet Island, while they didn't receive any information from a Labour councillor or a Reading Borough Council, did receive a letter from the Conservative Party offering help. Yeah, local MP, statute, um, state in the statutory consultation, you know, as, as with every other planning application, it'd be difficult, to be honest, you know, I live in Whitley as well, it'd be difficult to know, not know that that application was going ahead. I was asked many, many questions on it, you know, and I asked them, I'd, you know, to honest answers. I gave honest answers, and you know, we we do try and represent. Uh, oh, the question is, um, <laughs> um, would you not agree um, <laughs> that we do um, try and be open as fair as possible and represent our residents to the best of our abilities? 
in um in my workings with the council in the past i would agree um i work i always believe that it's far better to work with people than against them um so i've worked with the council for many things including um actually the uh, the was what I'm calling it the Gillette Park, but the Basin State Road uh, development where we put in um, park benches, etc. With my workplace, I prefer to work in a positive manner. In this particular application, I do not believe that that is the case. Any every single one of the businesses that was named in the report as being the local amenities has not actually been contacted by the council until they approach them. And if the three businesses that are named have not been contacted and no resident has come forward to me to say they've been contacted. It just looks, it looks bad. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody else wanting to ask you a question. So thank you very much for your time, Mr. Boulding. And we'll ask um, Rob Shrimpton, uh, planning consultant for the applicant to come forward and give us five minutes, but I'm just mindful that Councillor Carnell has left the room and he ought to hear, um, if he's to take part in the vote, he ought to hear what um, Mr Shrimplin has got to say. Mm, right. Do you think, well, I'm happy to wait for a minute or two, if, but, but I'm not going to wait for ages, so frankly. You can't just walk in and out of a meeting like this, I'm afraid. Sorry about this. Councillor e Embassy. Yeah, Chair, I don't recall ever being told off for going to the toilet before. I don't know if this is in our standing orders. I, I know members of the committee have previously had to depart for a brief moment. Oh, I appreciate the pause, but but I just, we've never had this raised. No, but in, I suppose in fairness, if he doesn't hear what the applicant's got to say, it's very difficult to make the judgment, but um, I'm going to give him a, another minute and then hope they'll Trapper both Hilton be back. is currently unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> well, There's so some officers who aren't apparently online. Is he coming, Councillor Robinson? Yeah. Facilities. Well, people, I think I think before the next meeting, Councillor Emerson has a point. Uh, we need to um, get some clarification around this. But I do also take the very real point that if members don't hear both um, both sides of, particularly when we've got members of the public or or the applicant wishing to speak, they should hear both of it. He's outside having a back, is he? He's probably outside having a cigarette. Where he normally is. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Right. Councillor Carnell, we have waited for you, but we're going to give some clarification before the next meeting about popping in and out of meetings, because if you miss key bits of um, the report, or indeed particularly when we've got members of the public and the applicant speaking, it's important that you are hearing both sides of the arguments. So um, we'll send some clarification round before the next meeting. So let's um, got Rob Shrimpton here, who's um, sh sorry, Shrimplin here, who's the planning consultant. We also have uh, other representatives of the applicant online um, who can answer specific questions if need be. So uh, if you'd like to just explain your role and then we'll start timing your five minutes.
Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Rob Shrimp. I'm a, a planning consultant, so I've been helping manage the planning application process. And we have a couple of my colleagues online who will be able to answer the um, detailed sort of technical questions that I'm not able to. Thank you. Um, yes, I'll go closer to it. Is that better? Is that, yeah, is that OK? Good. I think that's better. Thank you. So we're just about to start the five minutes. Over to you. Thank you. Good evening. The applicant, Reading Borough Council, have been through a lengthy process to establish the need for a Gypsy and Traveller Transit site and an extensive site search process that culminated in the selection of the application site. Assessing the housing needs of people living in caravans or houseboats is a requirement for local housing authorities under the Housing and Planning Act, National Planning Guidance and the Local Plan. Reading Borough Council therefore commissioned a Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Assessment in June 2017. Um, and with the great respect to the previous speaker, I found that when I googled it, it came up as the first hit. Uh, that identified a need for up to 17 permanent pitches and five transit pitches. So that's um, five transit pitches, 10 caravans. Without formal provision, unauthorised encampments appear and there were actually 87 in the year uh, that the study was published, 2017, which caused, of course, issues for residents, the council, the police, and importantly, for the travelling community themselves. The council undertook a lengthy search for sites to meet this need. Consultations on the local plan issues and options in January 2016 and again on the draft local plan in May 2017 asked for sites, but none were forthcoming. The council even took the step of writing directly to owners of all identified development sites to ask them to make provision, but again, none were forthcoming. A list of around 80 council owned sites was therefore drew, drawn up. Each site was thoroughly assessed, after which only one was identified as having potential, which was previously discussed at Cow Lane. But after further work, it was dismissed because it was used for the Reading Festival uh, and um, uh, we talk about uh, had a proposal for a school or subsequently was identified for a school. A further review of the sites was therefore undertaken, which identified the application site. And it's therefore the culmination of an exhaustive search. The proposal includes seven pitches separated by privacy screens and each with its own amenity block, has a bin store, play area, a picnic area and landscaping. The site separated from residential areas, the nearest being over 100 metres to the northwest and over 300 metres to the east on Kennet Island on the other side of the A33 but also within walking distance of shops, amenities and public transports. The site's been subject of detailed assessment and the officer report explains how all the technical issues have been addressed. Residential development standards have been applied, even though the caravans are, of course, not permanent. Robust management procedures wouldn't be in place. For example, because the site falls at the edge of the extended emergency planning zone around the atomic weapons facility at Burfield, there'll be a management plan, spaces for families to stay put for 48 hours, a specific officer to manage the site and the site office in the unlikely event of a problem. And this, of course, is bearing in mind that using this, that those using the site might otherwise be in illegal encampments where there's no such precautions. A similar management plan will be in place because of uh, in, in case of flooding. Boundary walls will limit impacts from neighbouring uses. Again, bear in mind that those staying here will be temporary and not permanent. We respectfully request that members support the officer recommendation and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you. You'd like to stay there. There may well be some questions. Councillor Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you for coming and talking to us this evening. I've got two questions, if I may. I'll, I'll fire them both at you and then uh, yeah, in, take them whatever order you want. The first is the size. If I've read it correctly, there are seven pitches, each taking two vans and two cars. Um, the as you probably know, the most recent unauthorised encampment in Palmer Park over where I live, I think I counted in excess of 30 vans plus associated vehicles. Given that that seems a lot more common now, that this the size of the encampment it will, will be well in excess of 14 vans on a regular basis, how does this site intend to cope with that large um, uh, volume of, of, of vans and cars potentially turning up in Reading. That's my first question, size. The second question is, we've heard from an objector that perhaps local residents don't feel they were well consulted. Can you tell me what consultation was done with the travelling community to understand their needs? 
thank you. Um, well, in response to the first answer, uh, the first question rather, um, we're obviously we're restricted by the size of the site and what can be accommodated on it. So we've got tried to get as much on there as possible. You know, there's more space. As um, I don't know if you have the site layout there, you can just see it in the in the corner there. So it has amenity areas, bin stores, picnic area. So that of course improves the amenity of the site, makes it a better site to be, but of course reduces the number of vehicles you can get onto it. But that is the maximum that could be accommodated on the on the site. Um, I said previously that the, I mean, it, it does meet, um, according to the uh, assessment that was done, 90% of the need for transit sites. So I appreciate that there are, it may well be in your example, there are more people there than was suggested. But through the assessment that was undertaken, it said this would have, this would um, meet 90% of that need. In terms of um, consulting with the Chips and travel community themselves, there's actually an officer at the council who engages with them because, as you can imagine, they're quite a hard to reach community. Um, they don't, I mean, things as such as the concept of land ownership are, are not part of their cultural approach. So they have been consulted. This is a, um, through that specific officer, this is a site that they've used in the past. Um, the reality is that they would prefer a permanent site. Um, they have an attachment to Reading. Um, there's a historic, I, I didn't know this until I was um, told, but there's a historic attachment to Reading because the, in the past the, um, the hospital has been very welcoming of gypsies. So uh, lots of people have been born there and the community, although they move around, like to come back to where they were born. So as a result, there's been, it's, uh, people feel an, an, attract, an, an attachment to an area and their generations go through it. So um, they would, in all honesty, prefer permanent sites. Um, but I suppose this is you know, this is a step towards that. Thank you very much. Could I have one quick follow up, Chair? The assessment that was yes. undertaken regarding need and size, was, was that, uh, how many years ago was that now? Uh, 2017, so it's already a little while ago, yeah. Okay, Councillor Lee. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm just wondering what would be uh, and I don't know whether the, the, you would be able to answer this or whether it's a question for the officers, but I'll ask it now and then it can be addressed accordingly. Um, it's seven pitches and as Councillor Williams was saying, a lot of the um, encampments we've had in, in across the last year have been more than seven pitches worth of stuff. What happens if the permanent site gets filled up and we've still got issues? What, what, what are the next steps? Because uh, obviously we've we've referred to the fact the police will have extra powers, but if the permanent site is full, are those powers no longer relevant? I I don't know. Thank you. I just remind you though, it is not a permanent site; it's a transit site. But, yes. Uh, yes. Do you want to respond to that? Thank you. Yeah, quite well. It's a, yeah, it's a it's a permanent transit site. Um, I I I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I don't know if Darren, who is uh, online, knows. Darren, are you there? Yes, sir. Did you, you heard the question? Yes, yes, I did. Um, what I would say um, in, in response to that question is that the, um, the, the sort of a medium um, term plan and a short term plan. So the short term plan was to look for a transit site as part of the assessment in terms of gypsy and travellers. We would also be looking for a permanent site over the long term. So this is kind of a medium position is to provide that transit site within Reading Borough. And we're working with our um, authorities surrounding Reading to work with them over um, alternative pitches as well. Councillor Leng, I think you are next. Yeah, uh, thank you for your representation. It was more, uh, if it's uh, if it does get passed tonight, it's about an operational thing, really. It states in 6.2620, uh, uh, page 104, that there'd be an on-site officer. And it was to, it was to do with the, the booking as well. You know, if people roll up, how do they how do they book? Who do they, who do they get hold of? How are fees collected? If you, it states that you're going to have, a, I think, one liaison officer 
But, you know, if it's a 24 hour a day operation, which it would be, that would be three shifts at three offices. You know, you know, how is this going to, is it, is it guaranteed to be 24 hours on site? I'm not just talking about security, I'm talking about liaison officers. You said there was there was one liaison officer. You know, how, how are we going to stretch that so it becomes a 24 hour site? Understood. There is currently one liaison officer. Um, I understand the plan is to expand that role so that it can be managed 24 hours. Um, there is a condition requiring that plan. So there's a condition that require a detailed management plan, which will set out exactly how all of that is delivered. Because as you can imagine, often the planning application stage, not all, asked, not all details have been worked through, but that was, uh, that's the intention. And then like I say, the condition secures that. And again, I don't know if Darren or Shweta have any comments on that. Darren, are you with us? Um, hello again, sorry, <laughs> a bit of a lag there. Um, yes, I think uh, we're committed in, in terms of housing. So um, Zalda is committed as the um, Assistant Director for Housing and Communities um, to ensure that there's an appropriate level of management um, on the site in order to make sure that um, the, the Gypsy and Traveller community have an opportunity to engage with an officer in terms of services, but also in terms of how the site is managed. So yes, um, we're committed to providing whatever is required to make the site work. Councillor Ling, you want to come back, yeah? So just to clarify, there's 24 hour a day on site um, officer, the yeah, on officer. Yes, if, that is, if that's what's required. Yeah, okay. I'm not seeing anybody else. So if there are, oh, Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know whether you're the, the right person to ask on this one. Um, calling it a transit site, does that mean that once a permanent location is found that the transit site would be closed at that point? And secondly, um, I have real concerns um, over safety. And I'm talking about, you know, the traveller community normally have young kids. Um, yes, there's a proposed playground and what have you, but access to healthcare, where is the nearest healthcare? Looking at, um, you know, what it says about the, the closeness of uh, facilities, um, you know, it says, going by the normal guidelines, 400 metre walking distance. This is a five minute walk, which tends to be used to gauge accessibility on foot to bus stops and local services. The site is approximately 600 metres from facilities in the centre of Kennet Island. Um, does that include education or does that include uh, health care? From my understanding, it doesn't. So I'd like to understand from a, you know, from a perspective in terms of what exactly are the facilities that the um, residents of this um, transit site will actually benefit from, from that, from being in that location. And also bearing in mind that the A3, uh, which separates um, Kennet Island from uh, this particular site is a very busy road and it's fast and if you've got young kids in in the proximity there might be um, serious concerns over their welfare. Okay. Um, well the first part of the question was whether uh, if the permanent site were open this would be closed and that wouldn't be the case this would remain in place as a transit site so there's a need for, for both. In terms of uh, facilities well, of course having a, a fixed transit site, even if it's only used in transit, allows people to get used to the local area and understand what's in the local area. There is a school within a kilometres walk on uh, in Kennet Island. The centre of Kennet Island has uh, a number of shops. I don't know, I'm afraid, if there's a, a doctor's surgery there. Um, but I, I mean, there will be, or it's obviously, there's a large residential hinterland there.
sorry, not seeing anyone else indicating. So um, I thank you very much for for joining us and then uh, we'll be moving on to the discussion in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Page, are you indicating, yeah? <clears throat> yes, Chair, can I thank the um, officers for a very thorough and comprehensive um, report. I've been involved with the search and discussions um, around the search for sites, both permanent and transit now for uh, coming on to 25 years on the authority. Um, and uh, I would just make the point to through you to Councillor Robinson. He's clearly not read the report, but we are required to provide both permanent and transit sites. That is a legal requirement on all local authorities. The search for permanent site continues, but as is recognised in our local plan and was accepted by the inspector only a few, uh, what, three years ago, um, the chance of providing an adequate permanent site, much larger than the transit site that's required, um, would mean that we would be looking for a site outside the borough in cooperation with adjoining authorities. Um, adjoining authorities uh, of the blue tinge, uh, Councillor Robinson, have been completely resistant to fulfilling their legal obligations on either front and certainly in cooperating with us. And I repeat on the record, our request to both Wokingham and West Berkshire um, join with us. We will pay our fair share if you are willing to work with us on providing a permanent site close to Reading, but certainly not within the Reading boundaries for the reasons that we all understand. So the permanent site still has to be delivered, but this is a focus on a transit site, which is smaller um, because of the assessment process and the needs for that are set out in the report. Again, it's a legal duty on local authorities. Most of them shirk it and run away from it. And I can understand up to a point why. These are difficult issues and whatever site you propose um, is going to face a level of local resistance. And this council uh, has gone through a very exhaustive process and exhausting process where we've looked at um, over 80 sites in our own on our own land. Um, and uh, page, I think, 129, um, that penultimate paragraph um, Mark Worringham, in his excellent submission, um, refers to the identification of 80 sites that we did for further assessment. That's a public document, it's on the website, and the assessment for each site uh, is spelt out, um, and the reasoning for not proceeding with those. A large number of them were on sites that were landlocked or very close to existing residential um, developments. Um, we did identify the preferred site, as has been referred to earlier, uh, at Cow Lane. Essentially, it wasn't the Reading Festival objection that prevented that going forward. Uh, it was the overwhelming need for us as an educational authority to provide a new secondary school. And I defy anybody to say that given the, tr the need for a transit site and the need for a secondary school, both of which are legal obligations, um, the latter, namely the need for a school, clearly trumped that site. And then we didn't just abandon things, we went back to the drawing board because we're well, not quite to the drawing board because in that earlier assessment, this site had been shown as um, uh, a high candidate, um, a candidate high up the list for further work, which is what's happened. And that's why this site has come um, forward. Um, I do um, find unfortunate the description of the location of it as being next to a dump. Uh, is completely inappropriate. The RE3 recycling site um, through you uh, is one of the best run facilities in the country um, and is certainly not a dump. Um, the, uh, the site is well run um, and there will be need for further discussions with both RE3 at the, for their site and Thames Water should this application be given consent. I'll come on to the um, conditions issue in, in a couple of uh, uh, minutes. 
Um, so the, the need for the site is a legal need because we have that duty to provide permanent and transit pitches. And it's worth emphasizing, this is a transit site through you to Councillor Robinson. This is not a permanent site. They will be there for between one and three days and a, a maximum of three months. I would suggest that, that uh, um, certainly the experience elsewhere in the country is that the stay would probably be of a week or two. Um, and uh, um, for obvious reasons, um, this is a transit site. That is the description. People are passing through. They are in transit. Uh, and therefore, the facilities that are being provided are actually well above the standard of many other transit sites, which are literally a gate and uh, um, a site with perhaps a toilet block, um, but nothing like the, the standard that's being um, offered here. And the, uh, uh, the need for that site uh, is spelled out if you turn to page 101, um, you've got the key paragraphs on that page already been referred to by the officer in the introduction. Um, the provision of a transit site triggers the ability of the local police to be able to use powers that they currently cannot use. And whereas a permanent site can be located outside the borough, um, a transit site has to be located within the borough. Again, the law requires that. Um, and that's spelt out at the end of paragraph 6.9. So we don't have the luxury of sharing a transit site with Wokingham or West Berkshire um, in their area um, uh, because it simply would not fulfill that statutory duty, which then allows the police um, to deploy their powers. It's a bit of a red herring, the issue of the number of caravans, because in most of the um, um, encampments that we have experienced, those are separate groups. There are very few local traveller groups that travel en masse with 30 caravans. Um, these are people meeting up um, and uh, uh, the availability of the transit site is the um, gives the police um, their powers. And I would suggest, although there's no way of quantifying that at this stage, that the existence of the transit site and the fact that the police will therefore have those expedited powers is likely to deter um, unauthorised incursions um, because um, the travelling community uh, committing those uh, offences will be aware of the existence of that site. But that's conjecture. We can't prove it at this stage until we have the uh, the transit site. So the need for it um, is clearly there. Um, and it's a specific provision. And I, I think the issue um, of, uh, um, of equalities um, is addressed in that following paragraph in 6.10, that it's an unusual condition in the planning consent to um, ensure that the site is made available for a specific group. Um, but that point is uh, is made uh, clear and addressed um, in paragraph um, 6.10. Um, should we, as I hope we will do, grant planning uh, permission, the issue of funding uh, the site, there will be probably savings to the authority in, in clear up costs, but we will also uh, be applying to central government for support um, in, in, in uh, taking forward the, the development of the site. Um, the issue of uh, um, the uh, adjoining sites is a very valid one. No site is going to be perfect. And there is much work still to be done. And the um, representative for the Borough Council made that clear. Um, and in terms of the site itself, um, in terms of landscaping, ecological mitigation, site management, which my colleague Councillor Ling has already touched um, on, all of those are pre-commencement conditions, i.e. the work has to be done and signed off before the the works um, before the site can be opened. And, and I would suggest, Chair, that in view of the importance and the sensitivity surrounding this application, the issues to deal with landscaping, the ecological mitigation, the site management plan and the boundary treatment should be brought back to this committee for full and final approval. 
I think in terms of transparency um, and in terms of satisfying ourselves about something that is controversial. Um, some of the objections have substance, others are, I would suggest, a bit uh, exaggerated, but nonetheless, it is entirely legitimate um, for us to request that that should be uh, brought back to um, the committee. And the other point that I would make relates to um, the, um, the issue of, of health care. This, again, it relates to the, the, the fact this is a transit site. Um, the issue of facilities is addressed on page 105, and the conclusion in the appraisal is one that I agree with. Given that gypsy and traveller sites are frequently located in quite isolated locations, and they are um, in most parts of the country, it's considered that this represents comparatively good accessibility by choice of means of travel. Um, and again, this is not a permanent site. Um, so the issue of healthcare uh, in the sense of that which would be required or perhaps should be closer for a permanent site doesn't um, arise here. Um, but the site, the issue of site management is, of course, um, important. Um, and officers have certainly flagged up in paragraph 6.20 um, that that is an issue that they feel needs to be addressed. And again, that's why the site management plan should come back to us um, for um, for for sign off. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, Chair, I think that whilst this site obviously has aroused a certain amount uh, of objection, it is located in an area that is relatively central and accessible. It's not the A3, by the way; it's the A33. Um, but uh, but uh, um, the uh, uh, the the site. Um, has um, offers, uh, I think, a good standard of provision. Um, and indeed, if one were to dispense with some of the, uh, the picnic area, for example, one could get more sites, uh, more pitches on, but I'm not suggesting we do. Um, and I think it's appropriate that that level of uh, standard should be uh, uh, included. Um, but the site itself um, is on balance, I think, suitable uh, for this. We have had um, a long search and an exhaustive search. Nobody can criticise us for the lack of effort that we've put into identifying other sites, Chair. And I would, I would say um, to anybody who feels that there are better sites, go back to that report and come back and uh, uh, say that there are other sites that you believe are better uh, than this. There are not. Um, and on that basis, Chair, um, I would propose that we grant consent and that we ask for those um, pre-commencement issues to come back to us for final uh, sign-off. There may be other elements that, that colleagues want to add, but I think the core ones are uh, conditions. Uh, I'm just looking at page 89, uh, 12, 13, uh, 15 and 18, but I might have missed one, but uh, I would so move, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Williams, you are indicating next. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'll say a little bit less than Councillor Page, but I would like to echo his thanks to officers because I think it is an excellent report because it's clear, it's concise, it draws out the pros and cons. It doesn't shy away from, I think, as Councillor Page said way back at the beginning, uh, that it is a difficult decision. And I think the report outlines that very well for members. So uh, thank you to officers. Um, a few words from me. I guess th there's no point pretending that this site isn't needed, but there's also no point pretending it's not disappointing. For all the reasons spelled out in the report, it damages a green link, loses trees from the borough, results in a loss of biodiversity, replaced by concrete. It homes a legally recognised ethnic group in for a temporary period, just next to a sewage works and a tip. It's far from perfect. And it it, it doesn't appear that that much consultation has been undertaken with the travelling community themselves, possibly because of the difficulties of doing that. And it doesn't appear, certainly from what Councillor Page said, that our uh, local authorities that are neighbours to us are really talking and are really helping and are really trying to engage with this issue. Uh, they should be. I don't think anyone's going to claim that we don't need a good quality transit site. I'm not convinced this is it. 
But like planning officers in the report, I can accept this because it's temporary. So permission will be for 10 years from the point at which it is granted. And I sincerely hope, and, I, and I'm sure Councillor Page was expressing this as well, that those 10 years are spent consulting with our neighbours, getting them to the table, having that discussion and that consultation, and further consultation with the travelling community, wherever that's possible. We might not uh, all be on the planning committee in 10 years. Oh, well, Councillor Page will be. The rest of us might not be on the committee in 10 years' time, but if this site isn't used, or if it's replaced by something significantly better in that time, then I hope that the site is fully returned to its former condition after that period, if it's no longer in use, the trees, the green link, the biodiversity and all. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Len, you were next. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> as a ward councillor, this has been quite, quite a difficult one for me. And on balance, I'm coming down to support it. It's a statutory obligation. Um, it's a it's a we're critical need of it. And um, as um, Councillor Page says, I'll use less verbiage, I think, as Tony. <laughs> and um, I would also like to see the air quality added to um, air quality uh, monitoring added to the pre-commencement conditions, maybe some mobile monitoring or something like that. Uh, and um, yeah, um, I, I, I am going to mention some of the, the objections. I mean, we have, um, we do have unofficial sites, so to speak, and many, you know, quite a few in Whitley. We had quite a large one on Basin State Road, and we've recently had three in the past year on Acre Road, you know, which is relatively close to the Circle, Circle Hospital. You know, I didn't notice. Um, any patients leaving or people leaving leaving their jobs, and um, I, d I did have a cousin that actually, that actually works there. I mean, uh, we'll make just another quick point. I've never read up so much on detailed emergency planning areas, and I've even started to take into reading the AWE liaison committee minutes and and such like, uh, which will be coming to SEPT, I think, in in, in November. Um, I'll also say about the emergency planning area. Um, my mum, God bless her. She um, lives close to one, and she, she in fact lives in a, a mobile home. And it's a posh one with a jacuzzi and all that, but all the same, it's um, yeah, I think she does fall into that area. So it's a much needed service that we need to provide the, uh, the, the travelling community. But I do recognise the the issues raised by by residents and businesses. Hence, why the site management is so important. Air quality, I recognise. Um, I actually think the facility is quite good, by the way. Yeah, you know. And I also recognise, Tony, that some people still call it a dump. So, but it's not. No, but it's not. But, you know, people reference it as a, as a dump. So, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hornsby Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to re echo a, a lot of the points made by uh, Councillor Page and add a couple more. I think the key point in the report, as far as I'm concerned, is in section 7.1, where it says the determination of all planning applications requires a balancing of material considerations and often competing policy requirements and objectives. And that's very clearly the case here. Clearly, this site is not a panacea. It's, it's a medium term position that we uh, will improve the situation locally. And we can look forward to trying to work with other councils mm -hmm. Uh, to try and find a permanent site. One of the things in terms of weighing up, weighing the, uh, the different competing policy areas is that this is a transit site with uh, it's one to three days ideally of, of the time that people will stay there. So that weighs to me in, in terms of the consideration of access to, to things like uh, local facilities. And there's a sort of conflict because if you put it really close to local facilities and local housing, then you'll have an increase in the level of, of objections from, from other for, for other reasons. I think the council has quite clearly gone out of its way to, to follow a sequential test in, in determining this site. Um, it, it's, it's selected a site which is as far as away as possible from residential development. Um, and if obviously it's going to be a, it's going to be closest to someone within the borough because the borough's boundaries are so confined. So although it's 300 metres to uh, Kenneth Island, 
I, I think that's a, that's a reasonable distance to, to think about. Additionally, no alternative site has been put forward um, and uh, nothing, nothing that's reasonable. So some of these objections are saying we don't want this site, but there's nothing coming forward and there is a need for this site. And as Councillor Page said, also a statutory responsibility. Some of the some of the objections seem to me to be to be quite unfair in many ways. The Thames Water one is, is the one that I'm going to pick up on. It seems to be based on their own inability to invest in appropriate deodoring measures, despite paying huge dividends to to their and bonuses to to their chief officers. So I welcome their intention to to work to improve this. And if this that's a cat, this site is a catalyst in order to do that, that's very welcome. I also welcome a lot of the mitigating measures that have seem to be incorporated within this application. So the landscaping uh, is designed to, to uh, and we'll need more details on this, to, to avoid the intrusion of light onto the site. The emergency uh, uh, management measures are, are very welcome. I do have a question, which is, uh, if any of the, it says in the report in section 660 on page 112, that there's there's an it, there's a potential issue with disa disabled access to toilets, and I wonder whether something can be done uh, within the current framework of, of the development to mitigate that. Perhaps tailing one of the units, tailoring one of the units, or something along those lines. So um, the 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 main thing that that uh, I'm concerned about here, or one of the main things, is also that this site represents an opportunity. It's, um, it's all about relative costs and inconvenience, not only to residents, but also to the travellers themselves. Of, of these unauthorised encampments, if we can deal with that by providing, at least in some, some way, with, with this, then I think that is a good thing. And it also will help in terms of uh, cleaning up costs after, after unauthorised um, encampments. There's a, a further question that I have to ask which is relates to page 93. Um, it talks about uh, one of the, the plots being a single family group per pitch. Uh, now that concerns me because I would want to ensure that the wording there does not uh, predicate against there being two different family groups on a single pitch, uh, because we don't want to find ourselves in the position of losing one of those uh, 14 caravan places because Two of the places, two of the people are not related as a family group. So I'd just like that element to be clarified so that it is two caravans per pitch, regardless of whether they're members of, of the family group. But um, for all the reasons that Councillor Page um, has set out, I'm very much in favour of this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else. So would I wonder if officers would like to pick up uh, on the questions that have just been asked, but also on um, other matters that have been raised by members. I think there might be one or two uh, uh, areas. Uh, yes, please, Chair. Can we have the case officer come back and then I'll, p I'll pick up anything else, if that's OK? Thank you. Ethne Humphreys, would you like to just respond to those bits that you are able to, in particular, the questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to um, to give some um, clarification on some of the points raised, um, starting with the the, the consultation process um, from the, uh, the the planning consultation process side of things. That this has been undertaken in line with um, Reading Borough Council consultation procedures. Um, it, it was um, unfortunate the uh, that the date of the committee meeting uh, was uh, erroneous, um, but I understand that this was uh, rectified. Um, the the update report um, I I hope has given some clarification on the site allocate, allocation in terms of the comments raised about the cow cow lane site and why that was ultimately um, not uh, not available not deliverable. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the the healthcare and the education facilities, um, the, the site's not considered to be badly located. Um, it is considered to be relatively close to the town centre. Uh, it's not too far from um, the Royal Berkshire Hospital, um, but, but importantly, it comes back to the, the use of the site as a, a transit site and that sort of temporary period of time. Um, the, the site's not um, considered to be notably less accessible than other parts of uh, Reading Borough. 
it's not considered to be in a remote part uh, of the of the borough in that sense. Um, I think I think it can be agreed that this has been a, a you know a difficult process, an exhaustive exhaustive process for the site identification, uh, and uh, it's a difficult application. And I think if there was a, a robust set of sites uh, available and deliverable, and a demonstrated five year supply of such sites, then this would likely be a different uh, discussion but it does it comes down to this uh, critical need for such a site for a transit site such as that um, proposed um, in terms of the question about the uh, disabled unit um, we of having a, a disabled unit we could um, potentially look at uh, sort of securing such through the condition, but th th this could be constrained by the size of, uh, for example, the toilet blocks and whether they'd be uh, big enough that there could be some uh, problems requiring it to either contain facilities that are not large enough to contain or whether a larger building is is required on, on what's already a constrained site. But this is um, something that we could uh, could look at. Uh, and in terms of the uh, the other pre-commencement conditions, um, th these can of course be brought back to the planning committee um, for, for that review. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hornsby Smith, do you still got a question needs answering? Yes, yes I, I did. It was about the two caravans uh, and and, uh, and the family issue. Do the, I want to make sure that we get full use of the site, I think, if, if it's going to be approved, rather than it implying that um, some people can, can refuse to use the second part of the pitch because they're not related to a single family group, which is slightly implied on page, page 93. I just wanted that clarifying that that is not going to be the case. Ethne? Yes, sorry, apologies, I missed that uh, the question. Uh, yes, we, we could say that two caravans per pitch um, is um, is appropriate regardless of, of the group. That can be um, required and will uh, ultimately be for the uh, owner and operator. Thank you. Thank you. I think Richard Utoff wanted to come in as well with a few points. Um, Thank you, Chair. Yes, to, to, just to sort of um, uh, clarify conditions, really, that, that um, uh, just to just to pick up on some of the discussions we've had. Um, Councillor Page was um, suggesting that um, uh, certain levels of detail come back to the committee. Just wanted to be absolutely clear on this. Uh, it looks to be condition 12, the landscaping plan. Uh, condition 13, the ecological plan, condition 18, um, which is the boundary plan. Um, following the discussion and, and the points, yes, 15. I, I was, ju I was just, just coming on to this because, um, that's all right, um, that uh, Councillor Lang was, was making regarding um, the sort of 24 hour coverage of, of the site and the site management plan, as, as Councillor Page has rightly said, that would be condition 15. I suggest we put that into condition uh, 15 so that we, we, we're just clear about that. Um, Councillor Williams was making the, the points about the, um, the the potential remediation of the site. Um, obviously, to get the site to, to its condition um, suitable for this use, um, you may have noticed from the um, uh, from the plans as shown on the agenda, there's a fair bit of engineering works to be done. Um, the question is whether whether those works would all need to be undone at the end of the application period, um, the, the temporary period. Um, condition two at the moment talks about site decommissioning. What I would suggest is you might not want at this point to prejudice how you might feel at the end of that period. Now, I, I, I know we're talking about nine or ten years hence. But what I what I would suggest what I would suggest, and I've just discussed with um, legal colleague, um, is is that perhaps we can put an informative on that says that that would also come back to this committee as well, because then you would be able to decide what you think was a, an appropriate decommissioning or reconstructive remediation scheme um, uh, at that time uh, for for this committee. Um, I heard the comments on the on the disabled access and understand those points. Yes, those those buildings are going to be very small. It's possible some works could be done to one of them. You're not going to be able to 
um, make the uh, buildings any bigger, but you might be able to make the doorways bigger, concentrate on the thresholds, put a ramp in there, that sort of thing. So perhaps we can add an extra condition on that. Um, I heard the points about the family family group. Yes, that would be um, really covered by the, the site rules and the management plan. So I think those are the things I want to cover. I think the only other thing is Councillor Leng mentioned uh, monitoring air quality. I'm sorry, I missed that point. Can I can I have it again? Do you want to repeat what you said? Yeah, just, um... um I suppose it depends if you mean as part of this application, uh, Councillor Lang. Obviously, we have we have we have monitoring stations in place. I'm sure already along along a a33. Was your main concern to do with the um, with the road or the sewage treatment works particularly? Operational site site specific monitoring of air quality. Perhaps we could have that back as part of the what it's possible to monitor as part of the report back on uh, um, the management of the site and so on. Uh, are we um, talking about the uh, reception of air quality at the site? Yes, I mean, if it's been raised by residents that they're concerned about the air quality near, near the R3 recycling centre and the sewage works, if they're smelling the odours on Green Park and such like, and Kennet Island, it's relevant to the people that will be staying on, on the site. So it's a management thing, isn't it? Operational. I would think that if um you know if 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 there's bad odors there then 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 they need to be controlled you know by who is 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 another point. And I would suggest it might be wider than the site because clearly it's affecting other residents in yeah, that area. Yeah, exactly. So but it, but it's just, linked. I'm on about if 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 we've got dwellings close to that site, you know where the odors are coming from. This may as um. Councillor wants to be uh, Smith said um, we could use this to control that as well and improve things for residents, you know, because it's about quality of life and people that stay in there. Well, in response to that, I think we need to be clear on on what we need to do in terms of, of, of this application. Um, the, the the issues seem to be mostly um, the, the re three site, I think, is as, as the application, uh, as, as the report explains, is is reasonably contained, and I don't have um, concerns from in the environmental protection team of the odours from that from that facility. We are aware that there is a is is an issue with the sewage treatment works. That was that was designed to be a contained facility when it opened in around 2005, and it's evident that the operator, even though they have been an objector to this application has not been undertaking their maintenance as they should have been. Now that is um, an issue for our environmental protection colleagues. They are they are on the case with the um, with with the with the operator at the moment and they are and that is being sorted out and we understand that that is um, meant that the need for uh, formal action against uh, Thames Water is, is not being considered at this time. Obviously, that's that's an option that's still open to them to to serve some sort, sort of abatement notice if they if they don't do what they're meant to do. Regarding the uh, what we receive at this site, um, I think we can we can probably put under the site management plan that would probably cover um, what um, occupants should do at times of, of odour. Um, because that's the, the, as the report says, there will be, there may be times at the moment where there may be odours from from the sewage treatment works, and that's probably again part of this welfare officer that we want to be on 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 site to make sure the quality of life of those people is as good as good as it should be. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Just picking up on that, whilst we obviously can't require the applicant for this site, namely the borough council. Um, to to um, address the pro to to deal with the actual odour suppression issues, is it possible for us to ask when the pre-commencement conditions come back about the site management that we also have an update report from our environmental protection team that updates us 
on where we are with um, or where Thames Water are and where we are therefore in terms of uh, um, the uh, improvements because there is that email right at the back that lists the the deficiencies and clearly it's not we can't require we can't put a, a condition on but we can ask at the time we consider this wider site management for an update from environmental protection our environmental protection yeah. people to update us because on page 122 there's all that list um, of uh, following council officers investigation these actions have been taken um, and some are still pending and it would be appropriate then to have an update about that so could we have could I propose that as a sort of a, an informative to ourselves or whatever that, that we ask for that um, I think so either as part of that submission or a, or, a, or an information yeah. item to the relevant committee. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. OK, is there anything else that we've missed that needs to no, go into the yeah, uh, right. report back? I don't you, think you, so. I think we've captured everything now. So um, can I? Uh, I mean, this is a difficult decision, I think, for all of us, and we all wish there was a site somewhere in the borough that ticked all the boxes but that is not going to happen i councillor page has done a lot more work on this than i have but i can remember us pouring through those lists of sites and there was clear reasons why the vast majority of them were in no way suitable uh we've heard about richfield avenue needing to become a school uh, this is the only site that's been identified and we have a duty and it may not solve all the incursion problems but it will certainly go some way to help and i think as i think you're right we need to keep pressing neighboring authorities to work with us on finding the permanent site um, and i hope the government whatever that may be um, in the near future will perhaps um, do a bit of strong arming of local authorities to meet their obligations well, quite. Uh, so, yeah, let's uh, we need to keep that high up on the agenda as well. Um, so can I? Oh, Councillor Robinson. Yeah, sorry. I, I just had one more question, if I may. Can, um, page 112, uh, item 6.63, contaminated land, says um, the ground investigation report identifies contaminants at the application site then a little bit further along it says about the fact that there is a definite need for a remediation um, strategy but it says to be done firstly do we have any understanding as to what these contaminants are and b when we are likely to see the remediation uh, strategy for this for the site it's condition four councillor robinson it's a pre-commencement on page 89 condition to include um, item four contaminated land submission of remediation scheme pre-commencement so all that would be done before any work started on the site okay so I'm just about to ask for people to indicate whether or not it is a say it is a very difficult decision i think for all of us but can i see all those in favor of granting this application with all the additional information we've asked to come back on the detail and all those against any any abstentions right so that's uh, two abstentions everyone else voting in favor thank you very much that's i think been as i say a very difficult issue for all of us um but i think we've given it a lot of attention this evening which was absolutely right can we then move, go back to considering um item when i find my agenda uh item nine which is at land at 362 oxford road on page 57 which is steve biger is going to introduce this thank you thank you chair um full planning permission is sought for a new build development of 26 flats on a vacant plot occupying part of the former battle hospital uh, it's an allocated site allocated under uh, reference wr3j 
Um, the proposals are identical to those approved under reference 201391 in June 2021, except for the fact that the previous permission secured eight affordable dwellings on site, equating to 30% of the overall number of dwellings. The current proposal seeks to reduce the amount of affordable housing, with the applicant originally suggesting zero provision based on their submitted viability assessment. Both the applicant and the council's valuer agree that the current scheme is in significant financial deficit and based on the figures provided it would not be financially viable to build, particularly due to the increase in build costs since the previous permission was granted. However, it is also the case that a critical need for affordable housing exists in Reading Borough and the failure to provide a policy compliant amount of affordable housing as part of the permission, particularly on an allocated site such as this, would be harmful in respect of meeting that need. Financial viability is a material consideration, although the reason for the non-viability is also highly relevant to the amount of weight that should be given. Officers made it clear to the applicant that the initial 0% offer would be unacceptable due to the significant harm to meeting housing need and achieving the mixed and balanced communities in the context of the critical need for affordable housing that has been identified in the borough. A negotiated position has since been arrived at whereby 11.5% of the housing units would be secured on site, comprising two two bedroom flats and one one bedroom flat. The remaining 18.5% would be subject to a deferred payments mechanism to capture any increased profitability for further investment into affordable housing elsewhere in the borough. In this particular instance, officers are particularly mindful of the regeneration benefits of bringing this long term vacant site forward for development as well as the wider benefits previously identified under the extant permission. On balance, it is considered that the harm arising from the shortfall in affordable housing is marginally outweighed by the overall benefits and that permission could be granted on this basis as set out in re the recommendation on pages 57 to 59 of the main agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gavin. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is land which was um, those of us who've been around a while will know it's part of the former battle hospital site and has been empty um, for a long long time it was those of us who live in the area we were all very excited when there was the idea that it was going to be a health center but that fell away and it was reallocated in the local plan as housing land which um, having demonstrated that a health centre wasn't required seemed to be a good compromise. And in 2019, a, um, the developer came forward with an application, brought it to this committee with a 30% affordable housing um, uh, offer in it. The application was accepted and today, three years later or three and a bit years later the developer has come forward with absolutely virtually the same application there is a slight difference in the sizing of the, the balance of the housing uh, which is on offer but it is essentially the same application but now um, they are only offering 11.5 percent um, uh, of affordable housing now, it's my belief that we, the council and people who absolutely need affordable housing should not be the ones that pay for the fact that the developer sat on this land for three years without developing it. Building costs have gone up. Um, uh, uh, wages have no doubt gone up, the value of land may well have gone up, but in a sense that is not the problem of this planning authority. Our policy is that we ask for 30% of affordable housing and my belief is that we should stick to this. It's the same application that came forward which we uh, accepted in 2019 and I see absolutely no reason why we should now allow, because of changing economic situation for the developer, we should now accept less. There are still people in this town who are desperate for affordable housing, and it's to them we owe the greatest obligation, not to the profit margins of developers. So I would propose that we refuse this application on the basis it does not meet our policy on 30% affordable housing. 
Thank you. Councillor Moore, you were indicated. Thank you very much. Uh, I agree entirely with everything Councillor Gavin just said. I'm disappointed that even though we're bringing back, we're bringing back some empty land into use, which I think is a very good use of that land uh, in that location. But I'm again disappointed we're on the unhappy path of not meeting our 30 per cent uh, full by housing contributions. And this is just one of many applications we've seen in this municipal year. Um, and I'm, I think we should try and I think it's, it's we're going down a very slippery path here. And I think we should we've got to start holding a bit firm on things, as uh, Councillor Gavin said, and I will also be uh, minded to refuse this on the same basis. Thank you, Councillor Leng, you were next. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. I find myself in total agreement with Councillor Gavin and Councillor Moore. Um, this is an application that came in with the full 30 per cent affordable housing and then comes back to us with 11 and a half percent. It's not the planning authority's job to protect um, developers profits. It's uh, it, that they should they should uh, provide the affordable housing element that they agree, that they agree to. And uh, we. It's quite a volatile market out there. We recognize that. And um, I think it's um, probably only going to get a bit more bumpy over the years to come. Doesn't bode well with the affordable housing element when we have a uh, our new Prime Minister, uh, Truss, who, who states in the hustings that she viewed uh, affordable housing targets as a, I think the words were, a Stalinist Whitehall led initiative. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am on that note. We should, we, I, won't, I won't be supporting this application. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Page. Yeah, I, I agree with the comments that are made. I wonder if I could just invite colleagues to focus on paragraph 6.8 on page 67, which I had to read about 10 times before I, I actually uh, believed it. We're being told that the, the current application or the previous application that was consented wasn't viable. And then we're told that even if we were uh, minded to approve this latest application, quotes the advice receives is that the scheme would still be unviable even if no affordable housing were to be provided. Um, so um, it, it's, a, it's an absolutely bizarre situation. And I would suggest that probably um, the recent changes that we were promised in viability uh, regular rules um, simply aren't working because um, I doubt very much, although I've not seen the detailed viability assessment that the, uh, that the developer is taking any hit on the profit margin. Um, and as always, um, in order to protect uh, the developer profit margin, it's the local authority that's asked to take the hit. And if it's not on the public realm, it's on the affordable housing element. And I think we really do have to send a clear signal uh, to, to developers um, that uh, this is not uh, acceptable. Um, but I wonder if Mr. Vigar is in a position to share with us whether um, the developer, for example, has dropped his profit margin, uh, perhaps down to half of what uh, they normally might be willing to do. I doubt very much, um, but uh, perhaps if you can share a bit more around that. But why is it that, that a developer feels the need to spend time and money on an application that isn't viable? Um, so there's clearly somebody's fooling somebody, I would suggest. But uh, anyway, um, I strongly support us rejecting the uh, the application for the reasons that colleagues have rightly um, set out. Do you want to respond to that? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the precise figures in front of me, but my, my understanding is that they have a, a fairly standard sort of developer profit, which is blended as it flows into the uh, the assessment as a, as a cost. And that's that's one of the costs that the development has to cover. So um, yeah, it's a fairly standard uh, profit. I think it's normally around 20 percent, but it, uh, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, I'm afraid. Um, I think uh, our, our value our colleagues would have to give us a bit, a bit more clear advice on that. Um, but you're not aware of any no, 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 no large no. scale. No. Seeing anybody else. Oh, Councillor Hornsby Smith. Yes, um, I'm, I'm really surprised that this, is, this has gone down to 11%. Uh, this is a prime location. It's, it's right on a major bus route. It's on the edge of a, a district centre. And it's 300 yards away from Reading West Station. So to be if to, to be improved, yes. I think if, if we don't stick with our 30% on, on this one, our credibility in terms of that, of that policy 
would be down to zero because this is the, this is just about the ideal situation where it could be could be and should be implemented uh, because that's the needs of, of our population. Um, I have a separate query which is about the housing needs, which I recognise as a subsidiary concern, but it is a concern. Um, on uh, section 6.26 on page 71, uh, the report states that the overall mix is supported and complies with the objectives of policy H2. Now, the number of three bedroom units proposed is 30%, is eight. Um, now, policy H2 states as a minimum on new developments for 10 or more dwellings outside the central and defined district and local centres, planning decisions will ensure that over 50% of dwellings will be of three bedrooms or more. And I wanted to ask, how does this comply with that policy? And why is it stated in the paper? Through you, Chair. Um, I'll just need to check whether it's in a district centre, because I think the Tesco... Uh, I can we're... confirm that in paragraph 669, it says it's adjoining the district centre. Yeah. And many of these points are sort of uh, carrying forward from the, the previous extent permission. So in terms of, um, I, th I think in terms of that one, yes, I mean that's that would be possibly an error in the in the overall report. I think that's something we'd have to to consider. Can I come back, Chair? I mean, the concern that I, the reason I'm sort of hitting you with that is because uh, in an in an application in a um, constituents concern wanting to move to a, from a two to a three bedroom house. The reply I got back from, from the housing staff was that uh, there were 21 successful applications to, to move from a two to a three bedroom house after, after the 1st of January 2020. There were 329 applications. So clearly there is a real need for, for three bedroom houses um, and it's not being met. So this is why I'm st I, I would Personally, I support the idea of the 30%, but also feel that that 50% policy is also vital. Thank you. Not seeing anybody else indicating. Um, so I'll move this uh, to the vote in terms of us turning down uh, the recommendation to grant the planning permission um, and replacing it with a a recommendation or a proposal to refuse the planning permission on the grounds particularly of yeah, the sorry, sorry. You... and I was just going to come on to that sorry. for the main reason being uh, that they do not uh, meet the 30 percent um, affordable housing and in fact as I understand it uh, when you were negotiating with them, their starting point was no affordable housing on site. So you managed to get them up to 11%, but that's still a long way off the 30. And it's, uh, I agree with what people have said about the need to, to give a very clear message that uh, we're not going to roll over and just accept this. And I would also point out on this application that um, they had permission, as Councillor Gavin said, back in 2019. Why didn't they get on and build it then before costs went up and all the rest of it? So very interesting that they've chosen now when there's economic instability to come back and try and get rid of the affordable housing, in my view. Anyway, back to the, the main reason for refusing this is that they do not meet our policy of 30% affordable housing. Is there anything else people think we should add? Do you want yeah, to add in I, something I about- I to add the bit about the 50%, uh, which comes from policy H2. And it doesn't comply with policy yeah. H2. Yep. Is that- Chair, the, the only difficulty with that is, is the extent permission. Um, so the, the permission has been granted for a, a scheme, broadly the same. Um, character and the same same mix so um i mean it'd be entirely up to the, the committee but yeah they just need to be aware the extent permission also doesn't secure okay well chair if it helps i'll, I'll withdraw that but I'm, i i do feel that we that the report is inaccurate and, and that that annoys me because i feel i'm being misled here and and I, i'm not happy about that 
So the the reason for recommending or for us um, refusing planning permission is primarily the 30% um, affordable housing that we require and uh, they're not meeting that. So can I see all those in favour of rejecting this application? That's unanimous, thank you very much. So, Chair, do we need do we need the reason clarified for the minutes in terms of the the wording, or so in terms of the reason for the minutes? We need the reason the wording for the reason for refusal. I, I can I can offer. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. 